two, hey, check, 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 check. Cool, everybody hear me? Cool. Welcome. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening. My name is Mick Mancini. This is Adam Ledbetter on the keys. Give a round of applause for playing this. Took us off. And that is Ray Bowen over there on the bass. Ray Bowen. And Dave Bowen on drums. No relation. <laughs> um, I like to uh, start off the events like this with, uh, with everybody's favorite question. What the hell is that? So, raise your hand if you thought it was a xylophone. It's okay. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you thought it was a glockenspiel. You're wrong. Okay, raise your hand if you thought it was a marimba. Nobody wants to raise their hand now. Right? I don't blame you. It's, not, it's none of those. This is called a vibraphone. Everybody say that with me. Ready? Vibraphone. Very good. Vibraphone. So, if you're ever in a you know, in a situation where you're hearing somebody playing an instrument that looks like this, and you're not sure, all you have to do is look down here for the foot pedal. If there's a foot pedal, that's a vibraphone. If there's no foot pedal, it's a xylophone or a marimba or a broken vibraphone. But either way, if you, you want to look for the foot pedal, okay? Because the foot pedal does a magic thing. The foot pedal makes the notes long. So if I don't press the foot pedal down at all. This is much like on a piano. If I don't press the foot pedal down at all, and I hit a note, that's it. It's, it's that long. If I want the note to be long, ready now? Okay, so the foot pedal makes the notes long. It's a sustained pedal, all right? Okay. Now, all of these types of instruments have these things here. These are called resonator pipes. The resonator pipes make the instrument louder. Now the cool thing about the vibraphone, this is another thing that is unique to the vibraphone, is that at the top of all of the resonator pipes, where there is a bar, there's a little fan that spins like this on a spindle, and I can adjust the speed of it over here. And what that does is that gives the impression of vibrato. So if I don't have that fan spinning at all, it just makes a straight tone, like this. All right, sounds like they're calling you into dinner. Okay. But if I turn on the vibrato, listen to what happens. Do you hear the difference in the sound? Right, all of a sudden, okay. And I can adjust the speed of it, so it can be very fast. really slow or completely off. So the, vi the vibraphone has two very unique characteristics to it, different from the xylophone and the marimba and the glockenspiel. It's got a sustained pedal and it's got the little fans at the top. The bars are made out of metal, that's why they ring for so long. It's played with a mallet, not a stick. This is the mallet. The stick is different. The stick is small at the top, bigger at the bottom, and not flexible. The mallet is large at the top, small at the bottom, and you can bend it. Okay? So this is called a mallet. We play the vibraphone with mallets, and you can play with one mallet, two mallets, three mallets, or four mallets. You can play uh, a lot of songs with just one mallet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then the second tune that we play is a different kind of standard. It's by Thelonious Monk, and it's called Monk's Dream. And the reason I say it's a different kind of standard is in jazz we play um, music from the Great American Songbook, which is mainly songs from old uh, Broadway shows and plays. And, but then we also play songs written by the great composers, Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, Wayne Shorter, uh, So, um, yeah, so in this workshop, I think the plan today is me and Nick can kind of, kind of bounce off each other. Um, uh, I know we wanted to discuss a few things. Um, I don't know how many musicians are here. I have a question for you, actually. Okay, let's go. Okay, so regarding the, um, the difference between the two standards, quote unquote, that we play, one is from the Great American Songbook, and then the other one is written by by jazz composers. Mo mostly jazz composers who wrote instrumental music, right? right? So the songs from the Great American Songbook have words, and then the, the songs that are not from the Great American Songbook don't have words. Does that influence your playing of them at all? It does, actually. Yeah, so um, that was an old thing I picked up a long time ago. When you're learning songs from the Great American Songbook, one of the first things you should do is learn the words. Because a melody is just a melody, right? So it's kind of like speaking two languages at once. You have the musical language of the melody, but then you actually have the words which shape the melody. I was watching, uh, this is kind of on the topic. Mm -hmm. This was cool. Uh, Jacob Collier, which I don't know if you guys are familiar. He's this crazy musical genius from, from England who does He's from Saturday. <laughs> yeah, right. He's from way out there. But um, he was talking about when he was 12, he was in an opera. And the director of the opera had them go through every single line of music and highlight the most important words, the most emotionally charged words. And then they did an exercise where when they sang, they would sing the opposite of whatever emotional charge that song had on purpose. And the end result was that it gave them a greater sense of purpose and urgency for those words when they return to the normal emotional state. But by marking them that way, they're more aware. You become more aware. Wow. So since I heard that, I was like, I might actually start trying to do that. You know, it's like singing a love song, but then thinking about hate. But then going back to love, and then it's like, oh, it's that much more lovely. <laughs> but yeah, to answer wow. your question, like learning the lyrics for songs, I think is supposed to impact yeah, the way that you play. Sure. I agree. I mean, that probably one of the greatest examples of that is when somebody calls the Days of Wine and Roses. Is everybody familiar with the song, The Days of Wine and Roses? I've never even seen it. The Days of Wine and Roses. Everyone calls it like this jaunty little, you know, this cute little number. It's it's all about an awful moment in two people's lives. It's like, it's an absolute dark pit of despair, that song. And we're all like, do, do, hey. Right? And it always feels kind of strange to me. Now, I'm sure that there are other songs that I don't know. I don't know if there are all the songs that I play. I'm sure there are some that I probably do the same disgraceful treatment of, but that one in particular stuck out to me because I know that movie. And if anyone's ever seen that movie, The Days of Wine and Roses, you know it's not exactly a summer family blockbuster. Um, you want to play one of those instrumental tunes? Yeah, well, I guess we did one already, didn't we? I'm down to play some more. Anybody want to hear another song? Great.
All right, so we're gonna we're gonna mix it up a little bit. We're gonna play a Freddie Hubbard tune called Bird Life, which is based on the blues. But before we do that, we wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening in the tune when we play it. Right. Um, so essentially, uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but we have theme and variations. We have the melody that was composed and then we have a set of chord or changes that accompany that melody. And then after we play the melody that was written, then our job is to create new melodies spontaneously. And all while that's happening, the goal is to interact and understand everybody in the band has a somewhat different role. And I say somewhat because our instruments are different, so the roles are somewhat defined. Like I have an instrument that can play harmony. So I play mostly chords when I play chords and melodies. Ray is playing bass, which means she's gonna cover the low end, which usually means playing the root note of the chord, but can also go way past that. Uh, drums, y'all know what the drums do. Keep time, but make it also, impossible for anybody to hear what they're playing. <laughs> I see the drums as a little different though. Honestly, when I think about the drums, I think you guys are kind of like, um, you can really change the intensity and the kind of overall emotional drive of the song. You can open it up and you can close it down. And of course, it's the loudest instrument in the band, which, you know, is, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right. You want to speak? Yeah, the vibe the vibes are an interesting instrument in this type of situation because I can't play both chords and melodies, and so all throughout history, uh, the history of the instrument at least, there have been two types of vibes players. There have been four mallet players and two mallet players. And two mallet players generally tend to function more like a horn player, wherein they play the melody, they take a the solo but they bow out when it comes time for someone else to solo and for people for the rhythm section to interact. Four mallet players will play melodies and then also function as a member of the rhythm section as well, which is kind of the way that I play. The first two tunes that I played, I did, I played as a four mallet player. I'll put down four mallets, I'll just play as a two mallet player, and maybe you'll see there's a little bit of a difference in the way that I approach the song, because now I'm thinking just in terms of melody and not in terms of my role in the rhythm section. It's kind of like being a guitar player. Guitar players can play chords and melodies, so the vibes. Yeah, and um, a lot of times, I've heard a lot of people comment on, when they go to a jazz concert, they'll see like the musicians looking at each other and like laughing like a joke was just told. And I think a lot of times that's just because when you understand your role and your function and then you, you can subvert that or you can do little things that might be uh, provocative, you know, to get something out of somebody else that they wouldn't normally do or a reference to a tune, you know, there's, there's a million and one things, but essentially I think of it as like a, it's a group conversation. Yeah. And the goal is to really know what you're talking about be a good listener, respond appropriately, uh, don't be mean, because right. that happens on the bandstand too. That's true. Yeah, it does happen. We want to have a nice conversation. Bebop bullies. <laughs> They're out there. Yeah. They're usually saxophone players. <laughs> That's true. I don't know why that is. Too. There's, There's so many of them. bad rap too, though. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll pull you off the bandstand. <laughs> but I didn't play it like that. Right. Uh, this is Bird Like by the great trumpeter Freddie Hubbard.
trying to create some diversity with the set like if I play three melodies in a row I'm not going to take the solo the first time all three times in a row maybe I'll, I'll take the solo the first time and then maybe the end second time but then it's understood that he's done whoever just soloed is done that's pretty much their their chance and then the rest of their uh, the rest of the time they'll be just part of the ensemble or sometimes just standing off to the side waiting to play the main theme. Bass and drums pretty much are playing the whole time. It's and they usually solo last. Also. And they usually solo last, exactly. And this is just, I think this trickles down from the jam session format in New York City that was established in like the 30s and 40s. But really it's always been sort of like the horns. And then even within the horn section, there's a hierarchy. Trumpets go first, saxophones go second. Trombone players go to the bathroom. Um, and then after that, <coughs> there's, a, there's a guitar, if there's a guitar player, then the guitar player will go. If there's a vibes player, the vibes player will go. Then the pianist, and then the bassist, the poor thing, after walking for 170,000 choruses under all them solos, doom, 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 laying it down, then everybody stops 
playing, and everybody starts talking, and then she has to go and take a solo now. That's like, that's the bass player's pain. But the good thing about being a bass player is everybody needs you, so you're always working, so I don't feel bad for it. <laughs> and then there's the drummer. No, the drums, so the drums actually play an interesting role in the solo section, and that is that one of two things typically happen. Well, there's three things that usually happen. There, uh, the, the most common thing is that the soloists will trade with the drummer. And we trade in the order in which we took our solos, which can get pretty challenging if there are a lot of solos. But you just remember who you went after in your solo, and then that's who you go after when you're trading fours or trading eights. And what that means is that the solos plays over eight bars of the song. The drummer plays over the next eight bars of the song. So just because it's only drums doesn't mean the song isn't still happening. It's an important thing. Because when you come back in, you've got to come back in on bar 17. Then the next soloist, and then the drums. That goes back and forth. That's called trading either fours or eights. Uh, sometimes we trade entire forms. Another thing that will happen is the drummer will take an open solo, but open only means that they're playing all by themselves throughout the whole thing. But once again, they're playing over the form of the song. So if it's a 32 bar form, they're playing a 32 bar solo or a 64 bar solo or something. They're not just going willy nilly and then counting back in, although sometimes that does happen. And then the third thing that sometimes will happen is at the end of a song, the band will fall on a vamp, and the drums can solo over that. So maybe what might be kind of fun right now is to do a thing where we incorporate all three of those styles of drum solos in this song. So we'll trade, we'll give them a chorus, and then we'll let them blow over a vamp at the end. Okay. Yeah, Sound good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now we just gotta pick the tune. Oh, how about uh, stable mates? Okay, we don't have to do stable mates. Okay, okay, fair enough. I mean, I have to, but that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's something that's got like a little kind of a vamp on it? I can't, why can't I think of it? Is this oil? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you so much. That's that's a bit of a long band, but we could do that. You talking about welcome, welcome, welcome to the rehearsal for this afternoon's <laughs> performance, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. Yeah, we could do that, or we could just. In, in, uh, oh, let's do wave. I'm gonna take this all over the entire form of wave. He's saying no. He's saying no. Okay. Oh, well, let's do seven steps now. Husband and wife. Husband and wife. Okay. This is a tune called Seven Steps to Heaven. F. And what we're going to do is we're going to trade fours with the drummer. We're also going to give him an open solo. He's going to play over the form, and then he's going to play over the vamp at the end of the two. Lots of drums. Lots of drums. Thank you. 
Uh, Nick switched it up, so then we were doing four. And sometimes cats will even go with twos, they'll trade two measures, and then sometimes even one measure, which is really exciting on a fast tone. Uh, there's a great Winton record. Um, actually, I think it's the Marcellus family record where him and Bramford are trading and they end up trading ones, and it's like super fast, and it's like, wow, well, it's crazy. They can really count to one, <laughs> which is really hard to do. Especially when it goes by that. Yeah, yeah. And then Dave played an open solo, which again, he played the form. The first time we, the, uh, the tune we played before this one, there was a moment where uh, we all kind of laughed because as Dave was drum soloing, he actually played the melody on his drums. And that's what I mean about kind of like going outside your normal role to do a thing to keep things spicy and interesting, you know. The only rule is you should, you should break the rules from time to time, you know, mix it up. So, uh, and then he played over the van. We ended it. And it's, you know, it, it is, I remember actually, I was, a, I was a musician, actually pretty good musician before I ever knew what the heck was going on during the jazz tour. To me, it sounded like, could not cacophony, it sounded like chaos. I didn't know, I just thought to myself, these people have no idea what the heck they're doing. <laughs> I couldn't imagine that they did, you know? Yeah. And then as you listen more, and you get more and more in tune with sort of like the tropes that you hear and the different little bits of the language that you hear get tossed around. And then, you know, the best way to start exploring, to start discovering jazz is just, I'm just going to tell you right now, you just start with the record Kind of Blue by Miles Davis because that's up there with the top 10 most listenable records ever in the history of records. It's kind of blue by Miles Davis. And then what you do is you say, oh, I really like that alto sax player. Who's that? And you look on the back. Well, you don't look on the back because there ain't no back or front. You just look up on whatever good advice you're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> Who played alto on that record? Oh, Cannonball Latterly. Okay, well, what's he all about? And then you do a deep dive on Cannonball Latterly and you realize he had a group of his own with his brother Matt. And then they collaborated with a bunch of artists, and then, oh, I really like that Nancy Wilson singer that was singing on that record. We can't buy it, and then check out Nancy Wilson, and boom, boom. And then you start to see that a lot of them covered a lot of the same material, and you listen, and you start, you know, we're, as human beings, we're designed to find familiarity and patterns in the world around us. That's how we get through. And you will start to recognize patterns. And you don't need to know what they are. You don't need to know what they're called. You don't need to know what chord it is. You don't need to know names or any of that stuff. You just need to recognize it when you hear it. It's like, it's like anything else. You're tasting food or you're tasting wine or you're getting into any kind of thing. There are specifics to it and you just have to do it long enough to where you start to get familiar with repetitive patterns. In jazz, it's very hard to find repetitive patterns but they're out there. Yeah, they're definitely out there. Yeah. yeah, I think you hit it on the head and you said you start to learn bits of the language. Because essentially that's really what it is. It's a language, you know. And it's not, I don't even think of it as a style. It's a language. And we all speak the same language, but everybody has something different to say. And if you don't speak the language, then it does sound like gibberish. I that's have right. tons of friends who say, I don't like jazz because it's random. And it's funny to hear that as a jazz musician because it's so not random. Yeah. Like there's so much order and discipline that goes into everything you do. But that's because we're on the inside of the language. If you're on the outside of the language, it's like turning on Portuguese television. You don't speak Portuguese. It just right. sounds like gibberish. Yeah. But even before you understand the entire language, if you watch long enough, you pick up the context clues. And you could watch a sitcom and even say what happened on the show without understanding any of the language. It's all about what you listen to, what you hone in. And it's, that's exactly how human beings have developed over time anyway. I mean, you're, you, you can, you, all of us probably had pretty good command over whatever language was being spoken in our homes long before we took our first grammar class. You know, I mean, my daughter is two and a half years old. She's speaking full-on sentences. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit worried. To be quite honest with you, she's kind of like she's pretty advanced. She's, you know, we, but we haven't talked to her about a verb. She didn't know what a verb a noun. She didn't know any of that stuff. But she's communicating with us. We know what her needs are. You know, what what she likes and what she doesn't like and all that. So, you know, it sounds. Yeah, I mean, there's like the whole 
there's the barrier of having to learn the technique on an instrument so that you can play a scale because in jazz there sure are scales and there sure are arpeggios and all that stuff and so you gotta learn that kind of stuff but, but the idea of being able to express yourself should be no different than the way that I'm expressing myself right now and then responding as well exactly right 100% we're over time. Oh, are we? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much on behalf of Adam Ledbetter, myself, Nick Mancini, that's Ray Bowen and David Bowen. We really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Thanks for coming out to Ice Event Center. Uh, stick around, there's more music. Um, I'm doing a set at 6 o'clock, uh, probably with these people, and then an, an alto player who's going to blow your mind. So stick around. Thanks very much, Shonda. Thanks very much, Jason, for the sound. Thank you all. All right, y'all. Nick Mancini, Adam Ledbetter, Ray Lane, Bowen, and Dave Bowen. Y'all, the Rhythm Dream Team got many. All right, y'all. This is our last event that's going to be inside, so we're going to take it outside for the rest of our uh, our headline artists. Our first artist is going to be up is uh, Mike Fields, awesome, awesome uh, bass player. If you know anything about uh, the late Wayman Tisdale, uh, he's from T-Town where Wayman is, and so if you like that kind of music, you're really going to enjoy uh, the sounds of Mike Fields. After Mike Fields, it's going to be Nick Mancini, along with Clark Gibson, who just came into the room. Going to love them. Then Adam and I do a little something. I've already, Adam and I talked about it. I was like, I'm ready for the jam to start, so I'm probably going to do as little as possible so that we can get the jam started. Oh, with whoever comes out for the jam, but we want to thank Icy Good Center, y'all. But still, now just because we went outside, don't mean you can't hit the bar, hit the kitchen, grab me a little something to eat, a little something to drink. We got tables out there where you can sit and drink. We also have, I want to announce one more time, a free drawing for a sectional. And the sectional, you can look at it, is actually outside, look, uh, this way. On this side of the left side of the stage, if you want to check it out, but it's a free drawing, so you just have to put your name in to get this uh, sectionals. One of the donations we got when we were out looking for sponsors, so you want to check that out. Also, want to remind you that if you like what you hear today, you can come out on any first Monday to Live Jazz and Blues Mondays and check out a lot of these artists and get some of this same music. So, want to make sure that you come out and check that out. But, yeah, we're transferring outside to finish this up, and we're going to close it out with an open jam. So, see you out there.